I love the sermon title today because it's part of a little song that my daughter made when she was about the age of the children on this page. And the first line was, I just don't care about your stuff. And it sounds like such a terrible song, but actually it's a very moralistic song. Uh, we were, she was just at that age when she was uh, deciding who to have playdates with. And of all the considerations that might go into who should be a good friend, she was thinking, well, who's got the good stuff? And so we were saying, no, sweetheart, you need to just not care about the stuff that people have, but just care about their feelings and care about them. And so she made a little song. And she would go around the house singing this like kids do. It's so funny the way kids teach themselves. It's really miraculous. But the whole song was, I just don't care about your stuff. I care about your feelings, and I care about you, but I just don't care about your stuff. And uh, I just got such a kick out of it because of how it sounded to most people like you're disregarding them. But really, the, the idea is to look at the person and not look at the stuff. That's exactly what James is trying to tell us in the passage that we're going to look at today. It's just look at the person, don't look at the stuff. And uh, the, the passage that we're going to look through today is James 2, 1 through 13. It's amazing how many people kind of get off the mark of the very simple message that James has, and he's so direct. So we're going to talk about, bring some clarity to things that I think people get uh, confused about too. So let's ask the Lord to open up his word to us today. Oh, Father, we thank you so much that you don't care about our stuff. We thank you that you care about us and that you care about our eternity. You care about shaping us into the image and likeness of your son. And really, this is what uh, we're discovering in James, that even when we go through trials of various kinds, Lord, we can rejoice because we know that you're using them to shape us into our into your image and so lord uh, as we consider uh, how we fellowship together uh, from this perspective lord that we might have the eyes that you have when you look at us lord that we might look at each other with just those same set of eyes this is what we ask in jesus name amen so james is a very practical pastor and half brother of jesus has been telling us look consider it joy when you go through trials uh, everything's about uh, making you more like Jesus. Don't just be a hearer of the word. Be a doer of the word. And he says, uh, the goal is to do pure religion, which is loving widows and orphans in their distress and keeping ourselves unstained from the world. That is, thinking about things the way God does, not the way the world does. And so that's where we continue here in James 2. My brothers and sisters... Believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. This is just like you would explain it to a three-year-old. If you're believing in the glorious Jesus Christ, then you don't need to be showing favoritism. It's not what you do. And then he gives a hypothetical that uh, churches can relate to throughout the centuries. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but to the poor man you say, stand there or sit on the floor at my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges? with evil thoughts. A couple things. Sometimes when we read this, we go, oh, I have not been treating everybody the same. And I like the way my wife treated a, a homeless person that came up to her asking for money. This is a great story. I hope she doesn't mind me telling her. But this young man came up to her, and she said, hey, get away from me. That's not right that a young person like you comes over and intimidates me to ask for money. You sh that, at night, in the dark, it's just inappropriate. And you know what? She was loving him. And it might have even been safer for her to, to love him with that just rebuke than to open up her purse. But the point is, uh, the, the supposition that James is making is not a poor person who's intimidating, 
right? So it's not like we disregard all the externals when we evaluate people. We need to do that. Jesus did that. He spoke to the rich young ruler differently than he spoke to other people. He spoke to the Pharisees differently than he spoke to the prostitutes. It's not like we're sinning just for noticing these differences. It's just in every case, we need to love them the way Christ would and the way we would want to be treated. And so facilitating somebody to mistreat us is not loving. It's not loving them as we would our, love ourselves. It's a subtle difference, but it's interesting as I was watching other people preach this sermon. There was a lot of like self-guilt, like, oh, we need to not see any differences. No, that's not what he's saying. In fact, it's not even what we're thinking that he's, that he's correcting the church on, but it's behavior, how you treat them. The, the partiality and the discrimination was in how they were being treated. This is really important in our day. Because in our day, if you disagree with somebody, you're mistreating them. You know what I'm saying? If you just notice a difference, then you're mistreating them. No, that's not the case. You can, you can genuinely disagree with somebody. You, can, you don't have to accept uh, how they dress, how they act. You can still disagree with all that they're doing Put your arm around them and love them. See, we, we don't have to, uh, if you disagree with somebody today, oftentimes you're called a hater just for disagreeing. No. What matters is, you know, God gives us the freedom to choose. And we can love people who choose differently than, right, than we do, but we can't change the consequences of their choices. We can love people who disagree with us. God gives them the freedom to choose, but we can't change the consequences of their choices. So when somebody is in a situation where they're in an addiction or some other thing, that you know it's not going to go well for them, we can love them. <laughs> we can even correct them. But we shouldn't show them the floor, and we shouldn't disrespect them. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? This is a big issue. This is a church, it seems to me, that is really dealing with wealth and, the, and a disparity of have and have nots. In the first chapter, you remember, he said, look, let the poor uh, glory in his riches and let the rich person uh, understand the uh, humility of his circumstances. That he's like the flower who fades and all our glory, human glory is passing away. So be humble in that. So he's saying, look, God has chosen the poor, those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in the faith. In fact, choosing, once we are rich in the faith, then we tend to be lose credibility in the world. That's a fact of life, isn't it? So God has chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in the faith. It does seem to. Remember when the rich young ruler came to Jesus? Jesus had a special, special message for him. And Luke tells us that he saw this young man and he loved him. And he said, this young man was not aware that he had broken any of the law of God. He thought he had followed it all. And Jesus lovingly points out to him that there is something that he has made a, an idol of. And so after he says, oh, I've kept all the law, Jesus, what else do I have to do? Jesus says, look. First he says, he called him good teacher. He says, nobody's good but God alone. You think you're good, but only God alone is good. And then he says, uh, one thing you need to do, sell all your possessions, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. And the man's face fell. This was a particular message to him. Jesus had lots of disciples who were very wealthy but they love God more than their wealth. So Jesus didn't ignore this young man's circumstances, but he figured out what he needed to get closer to the Lord, and he spoke directly to that. It is true, it seems, that when the gospel goes out to very poor people, they, re they receive it and accept it, whereas middle-class people and upper-class people are deluded enough to think that we, we've got things under control. We've managed a good life. I think it's harder to share the gospel here in Lucadia oftentimes than in third world countries where people receive it with joy. 
So God has chosen the poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor. It is, not, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of whom you, uh, to whom you belong? Now, think about this for a minute. Imagine if on a Sunday morning, and he's just supposing that a rich man and a poor man come in. Well, imagine if you sat in a pew today in our little church and a movie star sat next to you. Let's say Tom Cruise sat next to you. <laughs> that would be dishonoring Tom Cruise. Did you say yuck? <laughs> right, and then suppose on the other side, a congressman or a judge sat down. <laughs> well, we got to fill our pews with these people, folks. Not because, not because we need them, because they need us. But uh, we shouldn't dishonor anybody. But you guys are a rough crowd. <laughs> well, would you be, are you ever starstruck by anyone? What's that? Johnny Depp? Joyce Meyer? Well, you know, this happens in the church, too. Uh, you know, oftentimes, oh, here's the place that the... I, I think somebody's telling me about a situation with Charlie Stan... What is it, Charles Stanley and his son, Andy Stanley? Stanley. They went into a place, and, and uh, I heard this very secondhand, but they recognized Charles Stanley, but they didn't recognize his son, who was a featured speaker. So the dad was ushered, uh, ushered up to, here's the place where the impressive pastor sit, and the son, well, <laughs> treated like a regular hoi polloi. So it does happen in the church. And people, in fact, uh, what is it, Chan, what's his first name? Francis Chan. Francis Chan. He, he was preaching on this, and the night before, w during his service, he had a hidden camera. And he stood in the back where, where people greet, and he stood back there, and he, st and he stood next to, he got like a punk kid from their high school group with an earring in his lip, a, a lip ring, I guess. S st they stood there together. And everybody came up and hugged the pastor and greeted the pastor. Hardly anybody spoke to that young boy who really needed to be spoken to. One, people, one, one couple spoke to him and said, would you hold the camera and, and take a picture of us with the pastor? One of the ushers really did speak to the boy and reached out to him, but it was amazing. Even, even the other pastors came up and just hugged and greeted the pastor, but walked past the young person. So yeah, we can have like church celebrity problems too. And, and that's exactly what he's talking about here. He says, uh, but, but when he's talking about the rich, he's talking more like those who exploit us. And the, I'll tell you, you might not be struck or dumbstruck by, by the real power brokers. But man, there's all kinds of sycophants around politicians. And part of it is because they're sucking up to them to get something. And so James is saying, don't look down at anybody, but don't suck up to anybody either. Be quiet, because we are in fellowship with the glorious Jesus Christ. He is our shepherd, we shall not want. We don't need to suck up to somebody who's wealthy who comes into the church because God's going to meet all our needs. He, he's he's going to meet all our needs. We don't have to be impressed. So if you picture yourself sitting with uh, Joyce Meyer and Tom Cruise, you know, and he does, you know, the actors, uh, they wield a lot of power and a lot of people are starstruck, but they blaspheme Jesus Christ in the movies all the time. They don't even believe in him. How come they use his name, right? <laughs> they blaspheme the glorious name. It was going on then, and it's going on now. And he says, you know, don't suck up to those people. So here you are sitting with Tom Cruise and Joyce Meyer and a federal judge and a congressman, and now just picture Jesus sitting in front of you. Even the glory of Joyce Meyer doesn't come. You're right? See, when we recognize, hey, when we sit down, when we enter a building, Jesus Christ enters that building because we are the temple of God. And so we don't have to be starstruck or stammer in front of anybody, but we can show due respect. 
This does not mean we don't show there's elsewhere where the Bible says, look, uh, those who are elders are worthy of double honor. So we mean no disrespect to Joyce Meyer today. Right? But we need to respect everybody. Why? The, the reason we respect everyone is because they bear the image of God. And then if there's something else that we want to honor them for, that's fine too, but it doesn't even come close to bearing the image of God. But if we were to treat somebody and say, you sit on the floor, then we dishonor the poor. And that's what he's saying. That must not happen among Christians. We must recognize the, the, the image of God in everyone we meet. And sometimes we do that even as we rebuke them, which is done in love and disagree with them, which is done in love. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, he's going to tell us what that is, but just stop there for a minute because I want to think, what is the royal law found in Scripture? And he had talked about this, this law that brings peace. What is the law that brings peace? This royal law found in Scripture. Maybe it's royal because the king presented it when they asked what's the greatest law love God with all your heart soul mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself really when you think about it uh, if we look deeply he said look if you look deeply into that law it's going to change your behaviors that's what we read last week if you really keep the royal law found in scripture love your neighbor as yourself you are doing right it's simple, but it's not easy. It's simple, but it's not easy. Uh, try to go through one day. You know, so it means like you wash your hands and you take that paper and you throw it in the waste paper basket in the, you know, like in a public restroom and it falls on the floor. And you think, you know, I really don't want the janitor to have to clean that up. I'm going to pick that up. I mean, there's just so many little things where we need to treat we need to treat others the way we would like them to be treated. Greeting them the way we'd like to be greeted. If we really put our mind to that, we're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as the lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not commit murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Now, this passage has confused a lot of people. And I've heard a, a lot of people brought this question to me. Does that mean all sins are equal? Well, yes and no. It means all sins are categorically the same, but they're not equal in their particulars or their impact. Another place where this brings confusion to this is when Jesus says, look, if you are, the, the law says don't commit adultery, but if you lust for a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery in your heart. Uh, the law says don't commit murder, but if you've been angry with somebody in your heart, then you've, you've committed murder in your heart. Now, look, he is not saying that they're just as bad. It's way worse to commit adultery than to lust in your heart. I mean, it impacts families. The consequence is way worse. And the same with, you know, otherwise you say, well, I was angry with them. I might as well just take them out. It's just a sin, right? These sins are categorically the same in that every sin, no matter how small you could imagine a sin, if it's in rebellion of God, it's enough to separate us from God and need his grace and mercy. So all law, all, all law breaking is the same in that sense. It's that just the most minutest means that we need God's mercy. So I was thinking about this like if I were, you know, I'm a terrible golfer, really bad. I'm always embarrassed even to be out there golfing. But just imagine I'm there and I'm, and I'm right there in front of the windmill, you know, how that always is. And, and, and I pull back and I say, I'm going to really drive this thing. And I drive it. And it goes and it hits a, a big expensive building, a big house right next to it. And this house is a very affluent house. And it has a big window. The whole front wall is a window. It's just this huge window. And, and my little orange golf ball 
goes right through that window. And I go, oh, boy, yeah, I really did that. I better go kind of retrieve my little orange ball and give it back to the guy. But I go back there, and the, guy, the house owner is standing right there with my little orange ball. And I say, excuse me, I think that's mine. <laughs> and he goes, you bet it is. And I go, oh, I feel terrible about, about breaking this big old window. He goes, yeah, I do too. I go, well, I want to pay for it. He goes, you bet you'll pay for it. I say, good. And I reach in my pocket, and I take out $20. And he's not impressed. And he goes, no, 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 this, this window costs $200,000. I go, I know, but my little ball just went through that little part. So I'm just paying for the little part where my ball went through. No, it doesn't work that way. That's how all sin is the same. All it takes, it says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Any sin shatters it so much that you cannot be reconciled to God except for Jesus on the cross paying for your sin. But then uh, Jesus gives an example. He says to Pilate, he was actually showing compassion to Pilate here. Pilate, the man who said, I find no guilt in this man, but go ahead and crucify him anyway. He, he answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. So what he's saying is, look, you're a judge, and uh, it's your job to decide who lives and dies, and you're making a very moral choice here, but it is your job. Whereas uh, the, the probably Caiaphas, the chief priest, is going out of his way to bring me to you so that you could crucify me, that's a greater sin. So are all sins the same? I don't think so. He's saying this is a greater sin. He said Capernaum had a greater sin in rejecting Jesus than Sodom and Gomorrah did in rejecting the angel of God. So yeah, there are degrees of sin. That's kind of good for those who love justice. Apart from God's mercy, it's going to matter how we sin. Hitler is not going to have a, it's not going to be as bad, it's not going to be uh, just as, it's going to be worse for Hitler than other folks who didn't do the horrible things he did. So God is just, but we don't want his justice. We really want his mercy. Speak and act, James continues, speak and, act, uh, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown, will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, these are passages that are difficult because we know that we're saved by grace. But uh, when we read this, we go, yeah, I'm saved by grace, but I really don't want to be short in giving out mercy. This reminds me so much of Matthew 18. And it's one of my favorite parables that Jesus ever gave. I'm going to try to just... Uh, give it in my own words. But you know the story. First, first Jesus, uh, Peter comes to Jesus and says, how many times should I forgive someone? Uh, I think the, the Talmud or the Jewish tradition at the time was saying three times. You've got to forg you know, forgive people three times. And so Simon Peter doubled that and threw one on for good measure. And he said, how about seven times? Should I forgive my neighbor seven times? And Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. What? what? What's the calculation? Then he tells this parable he says, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle the accounts with his servants. And he brings one servant up, and he owes him a whole lot of money, like five bags of gold, it said, 10,000 bags, 10, bags of gold. More than this servant could ever pay back. And so the king, the master, says, well, throw him in prison. Throw him, his wife, and his kids in debtor prison until I get my money back. And the man says, oh, no, 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 king, please, no. Have mercy on me. I'll get it all back to you, I promise. And the, guy, the king is looking at this servant in the parable, and he says, there's just no way. So he forgives his debt entirely. Well, the servant goes out. He's free. He's happy. He's having a good day. And then he sees his buddy who owes him a couple hundred bucks. Pay me back right now. No. I can't. I don't have the money. Have mercy on me. He 
grabs my throat, throat takes him to the judge and say, look, make this guy pay all my money back. Every last penny. Well, the word gets back. The other servants can't believe that the king had been so merciful to him, and now he's worrying about this little debt. So the king, you know, the word gets back to the king, and I'll read this part because it's so frightening. The master called the servant in and said, you wicked servant. He said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. Then these words of Jesus just really are sobering. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Yikes. Mercy triumphs judgment. So, The more we recognize what he did for us, the more silly it is to hold a grudge, to be upset that, oh, do you know what that person, you know what they called me? You know how much they owe me? I had a friend who what has, he started our contemporary service, actually. His name is Tony. And a lot of times it'd just be me and Tony, and he'd play guitar. And uh, as I knew him, he had brain cancer. And I watched Tony deteriorate. He was very wealthy. He was really successful in selling mortgages. And as he got this brain cancer, he got very vulnerable and weak. And I remember sitting with him in a, in a restaurant that had a big cushion in the, in the booth that we were in. And he was so uncomfortable because he had lost so much weight. He couldn't even sit. And he, and he had these terrible headaches until the Lord took him home. And he said, Steve, this is one thing I've learned. He said, I would see people on the street, you know, like homeless people straggling, stu struggling and dragging themselves along. And I thought, what's wrong with that person? And he said, oh, that was so wrong. That was so wrong. Isn't that interesting? That's what he told me. This is the last time I talked to him. Because now he was, he smelled bad. He had such halitosis and it was just so close uh, he really reached out to the Lord in those last days. But that was the revelation was, wow, I shouldn't have treated people like that when they were vulnerable. That's what James is telling us. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let's pray. Father, help us to be wise as we love other people. It's not easy. And uh, we want to be wise. Lord, when we see people, we want to, when we see their failures, their weaknesses, we want to spot those only so we can love them through it, only so we can come alongside of them, only so we can offer grace and mercy to them. And Lord, when somebody offends us or mistreats us, it really is an opportunity to show the mercy to them that you've shown to us. Jesus would bless us when people curse us and he would call a blessing when people curse and revile us and do all kinds of terrible things to us because of the gospel, because of the kingdom of God. Well, that's the real equation, God, is, is when we have the opportunity to show mercy, it points people to you. It allows your mercy to flow through us. Lord, while we're here for this short time on earth, Jesus, and James says it's a vapor, we want to be conduits of your mercy, of your grace. We want to point every person who is made in the image of you to their Redeemer, to their source of reconciliation with you. Lord, we thank you that these words have come so clearly to us through James. We pray that we can be concerned about people's feelings, that we can care about people, and Lord, they can, we can disregard their stuff. We don't have to covet because you are a shepherd and we shall not want. Now, Lord, help us to live and love and speak uh, the truth of your grace on us and your purpose in us. In Jesus' name, amen.